You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 13, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atopic dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Luz Finasio. She's a professor of medicine and head of allergy and immunology at the Winthrop University Hospital at SUNY at Stony Brook. Um, so we have Dr. Fonicier here today, who is the professor of clinical medicine at SUNY at um, Stony Brook, and we're pleased to have her today to talk to us about um, atopic dermatitis. So thank you for being with us today, Dr. Fonicier. Thank you. I mean, it's always exciting to do this call uh, and talking to the residents and then uh, th this being available uh, subsequently to other residents who want to uh, uh, listen to the previous lectures. So today my task is atopic dermatitis and we would like to identify the common mimics of atopic dermatitis. We will discuss a little bit the workup at least what we do here in Winthrop, understand the treatment of atopic dermatitis and discuss some new treatments or even controversies on atopic dermatitis. So just for the fellows, the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis has evolved. In, um, we used to think it's all immunologic, cellular responses, but now we know that it's more than that. Uh, we have uh, actually uh, Excessive T-cell activation, it's a primarily TH2 dominant response in the acute lesions, and this is the part we're going to discuss now, where you have antigen presentation, after which um, Langerhans cells are then hyperstimulated, and uh, production of cytokines, IL-13, IL-4, and IL-5. There are also humoral responses, which increases IgE synthesis in the acute phase of atopic dermatitis. There are non-immunologic mechanisms. For example, the itch scratch cycle, we used to say that atopic dermatitis is, uh, is an itch that rashes rather than the rash that itches. And uh, here we have um, uh, toxins. Irritants, detergents, perspiration, microbial uh, staph aureus, and environmental factors uh, affecting the uh, chronic phase of atopic dermatitis. Uh, lately, when I mean lately, maybe over five years ago, uh, the defect in skin barrier is uh, getting uh, the limelight of uh, pathogenesis in atopic dermatitis. There's a loss of function mutation in gene encoding uh, filaggrin, which is strongly associated with the development of asthma in patients with atopic dermatitis. These are the two mutations that are associated with atopic dermatitis in less than one third of European Americans. It suggests that since it's only less than a third, that there will be additional mechanisms in uh, skin barrier defect. And uh, there are genetic variants of filaggrin, which are absent in African-American and Asian patients. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, there is probably a lot more of other genetic um, uh, problems that we will see uh, down the line. So let's talk about filaggrin. What is filaggrin? So filaggrin is this yellow stuff here. It binds to and it, res it is responsible for your keratin aggregation. So why is keratin aggregation very important? Well, it induces, keratin, when keratin aggregates, it induces these cytoskeletons to just collapse. And then they will form these corneocytes. And you can see that this will be an effective barrier to uh, loss of, uh, of uh, fluid from, from the other cells and effective barrier against microbials. The corneocytes are then, they are then heavily cross-linked, and they make up the cornified level, cornified cell envelope, which is critical for an effective skin barrier. Look at these uh, control animals that have very regular scales that are well organized, and look at this mutant, filaggrin mutant, where this is uh, disorganized and discriminating scales. And on a microscopy, you will see that those with filaggrin staining in a normal skin have a 
very good and effective skin barrier as against those in ichthyosis vulgaris and atopic dermatitis where there are no filaggrin granules and therefore they have a defective skin barrier. And that's what's happening to the filaggrin uh, mutation in atopic dermatitis, at least part of it. Another, uh, then the evolving concept of the phatogenesis of atopic dermatitis and other eczemas is the possible consequences of this skin barrier dysfunction. It enhances allergen sensitization and it leads to a systemic allergic response. There's an increased IgE level and there is airway hyperactivity. So now we see that the conceptual focus is really switching from an immunological to an epidermal barrier mechanism that underlies atopic dermatitis. That is, the absorption of the allergen to the skin may really be the first step and predisposes you, the patients, to the atopic march. So, so this is the kind of patients we dread to see in our practice. They come in, they have oozing, yellowish, scaly lesions in the face and all over the body, actually. And what do our fellows do? What do we teach our fellows as a, to the work of intractable atopic dermatitis? So we came up with this, actually, uh, put together from many different sources on a checklist for intractable pediatric atopic dermatitis. And what it involves is a good history of the patients and to rule out all other possible causes of the eczema. So the general principles, we ask them how they bathe, how they moisturize, what are their compliance with medication, the clothing, the sleeping patterns is very important, quality of life. Then, of course, the psychosocial triggers, is it the primary caretaker of the child, other health problems in the children or siblings, uh, the child's affect, the child-parent conflict, and motivation for treatment. We all do this, the food allergy uh, evaluation. We ask them if they are bottle fed or formula fed or breast fed. Uh, when solid food is introduced in the sequence and the food hypersensitivity, we evaluate for food and sometimes it's overuse. But I thought this is a great statistic because the majority of patients on challenge will only react to three or less food. So when you have a patient coming in, brings you a lab test that the primary care has done and they have 10 different or 20 different foods that they now are trying to avoid, you need to put to do a, a challenge to determine which of these are actually relevant. Aeroallergens we check, uh, dust mite obviously, we, uh, pets, cigarette smoke, and contact allergy uh, is going to have to be suspected if um, the patient initially improved and then started to get worse or there's no improvement at all with steroids and moisturizers. Realize that uh, uh, atopic dermatitis patients are at high risk. First is they have a uh, defective barrier function to start with. And the second is that they are exposed to so many medications, more than the normal population medications, moisturizers, and therefore they have a higher chance of developing contact dermatitis on top of their atopic dermatitis. Infectious causes, when you see honey colored crusting, pustules, weeping, consider skin and nasal cultures from the child and the caretaker, and you can give them empiric antibiotics. And there's some studies on intranasal Bactroban uh, to decrease carrier stage in uh, care workers. This is a patient who has fever, limb endopathy. You look at the vesicles and erosions, and you the, you, you would have to consider eczema herpeticum, which is very common in atopic dermatitis. And to prove this, you, you would have to do a chank smear and culture and put the patient on a cyclovir. Probably uh, less in our mind, but definitely a factor is a dermatophytic infection. You will see here yellow crusting, scaling, look at nail changes. You might want to do a KOH prep and consider a fungal culture in these patients. There is a, a, a fairly lately a report of a superficial fungal infection of malassezia or pithyrosporum spond 
spondylolysis, which is common in the seborrheic areas, and IgE antibodies against this in apoptic patients, mostly in the head and neck, when treated with antifungals, actually decrease the severity of atopic dermatitis in patients. The antifungal treatment of this is just topical. There's no need for systemic treatment for this. But something that you need to watch out for, which can aggravate atopic dermatitis. We need to look at the differential diagnosis. What are the immune deficiencies that are associated with severe eczema? Well, we have the Wiskott Aldrich, Hyper IgE, Netherton's, chronic pneumatitis disease, HIV, HDLV infections as well. So let's look at this two-year-old boy. Was brought in for pneumonia, had a history of intracranial bleed, epistaxis, bloody diarrhea, failure to thrive, PTK, eczematous rash, as you can see here. The laboratory of this kid showed a low platelet, increased bleeding time, increased IgA and IgE, a low IgM and a normal IgG. So this patient should be a suspect for Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Now this is a six-year-old girl. You will see complaining of a very pruritic eczematous dermatitis in the face, around the mouth, the arms, and the back. This looks definitely looks like a kid who has atopic dermatitis, but more than that, this kid has a failure to thrive. Also has peanut allergy, which is common in atopic patients, and both patients have atopic dermatitis. So this kid has Netherton syndrome. This is a rare autosomal recessive genodermatosis. It has erythroderma, which we showed you in the skin. But you will clinch the diagnosis by pulling a few strands of hair, and you will see here trichorhexis invaginata, or the bamboo hair. This is what you have. Uh, the bamboo hair. At the same time, kids with nevertons in infancy has ichthyosis linearis circumflex. So what does that mean? Well, those are migratory, polycyclic, erythema, and scaling. And if you look at this closely, they actually have a peripheral double margin. So that's your ichthyosis linearis circumflex, which is part of Netherton syndrome. They have atopic diathesis. These patients are both parents with atopy, and this patient also has a peanut allergy, a failure to thrive, and they may have immunologic abnormalities. They have neutrophil function defects, impaired cellular and immune responses, and elevated complements. Now, this is a patient, a little older, who came to me probably about uh, seven, eight years ago, she had a five-year duration of pruritic eczema. Now, she's 61. There's no previous history of A to P. There's no family history of A to P. Uh, primary care thought that this was secondary to medication, and she has discontinued all her medication. She has been on topical corticosteroids, which did not help. So I biopsied this patient, and after the first Five biopsies were negative. I sent this patient to Mount Sinai, to NYU. And eventually, after a couple more years of um, seeing uh, uh, other dermatologists, was finally diagnosed as cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And that's not uncommon that multiple biopsies may be needed before you can make a diagnosis of mycosis fungoides. So the mycosis fungoides have uh, can often go on for many years. Warning signs are patches that are thin, wrinkled quality. Often, this is we call it reticulated pigmentation. You can see the small blood vessels. Uh, pruritus is minimal or absent. It's common in the premycotic phase and may even precede mycosis fungoides by years, and often in the lower trunk and buttocks. They do present as a plaque stage, you can see here or a tumor stage. At this stage, they probably will not come to the allergist, but I can see them coming to us when they are in the black stage or in the patch stage. Now, this is another 75-year-old uh, elderly with pruritic generalized rash. Again, she doesn't have atopic history as well. Again, you have this. She could 
very well. I have mycosis fungoides, but she had this under her feet as well. So I thought that maybe I should do a KOH, but the KOH was negative for this patient. So what I did was actually do a patch test. And if you see here, the patient has carbamix and p diamine, and actually this patient had contact dermatitis uh, in the, from uh, leather uh, and uh, rubber products plus a systemic contact dermatitis where we have uh, the generalized uh, rash from her contact dermatitis in the foot. This is another patient we, I saw in 2006, I think, at the 54-year-old, referred by the dermatologist for a rash on the face, arms, back. Uh, he does respond beautifully to oral corticosteroids, and he had uh, recently started aronophane for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, way back then, they were st still giving gold as a treatment for um, rheumatoid arthritis. So these uh, were his lesions, and uh, we stopped the gold treatment, and, uh, and he had marked improvement. Uh, this is eczematous drug reaction, and there are certain drugs that are predisposed to giving you eczematous type of drug reactions. Gold is one of them, which unfortunately may progress to erythroderma. Bleomycin, penicillin, chloramphenicol, quinidine, beta blocker, methyl dopa, and clonidine. Just a list to keep in mind. So once you've ruled out other causes of eczematous dermatitis and you've made a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, what are the principles of therapy? The first is a general supportive care, then get the disease under control, and then keep it under control. So General supportive care, skin hydration and barrier therapy, emollients, bats, and wet wraps, and of course, avoidance of irritants and specific allergens. Get the disease under control with anti-inflammatory meds, and those are the topical corticosteroids and topical uh, calcineurin inhibitors, and keeping it under control by using steroid-sparing agents and the proactive treatment. Let's go to each one individually. Skin hydration and barrier therapy. So emollients by itself improves skin barrier function and it reduces susceptibility to irritants. Interestingly, adding emollients actually strengthens by delaying intercellular filaggrin uncoiling. So it does have therapeutic effects aside from just being a physical barrier. Regular use of topical corticosteroids can actually inhibit epidermal fatty acid synthesis and disrupt barrier function. So emollients, if you can get away with just emollients, is probably the way to go. Um, supportive regular use of, of appropriate emollients is uh, very important. What about baths? So I tell my patients there are two types of baths, a long bath and a short bath. The long bath is soaking in the bathtub for 20 minutes with or without oatmeal base, and then quickly rinse with a mild wash, and then apply your moisturizer on wet skin. I recommend this about twice a week. Then, on a daily basis, is a quick five-minute bath, drip dry, and apply occlusive emollient immediately. The principle of the bath especially in children, is you just have to make it fun. It has to be fun for the kids so they don't mind getting, getting it twice a week in the bathtub. So what soaps do you use? Mad soaps and cleansers. Uh, I give them either Dove White or Vaniderm, but some of them can use Basis, Neutrogena, Vena, Purpose, or Cetaphil. They're all good choices. Antibacterial soaps such as Chlorhexidine and Triclosan on a limited basis. And detergents, uh, that I ask them to use liquid detergents for their uh, wash and to add a second rinse cycle to remove all the powder or liquid or detergent irritant uh, materials in their clothing. 
I wanted to bring up the only uh, study on bleach baths on colonization. Uh, this, this is done by Wong, uh, 31 atopic dermatitis pediatric patients. They, gave, they removed the staph aureus uh, by giving this scared cephalexin for 14 days. Then they gave uh, intranasal nupirazine five days a month, and sodium hypochlorite, this is a bleach bath, sorry, twice weekly for three months. The placebo is petroleum ointment and plain water by thrice weekly for three months. And they, not, they noted that the easy score reduced after one month and three months compared to placebo, so that's statistically significant. But only the body parts that were submerged during the bathing improved. So the head and neck, which is not submerged, was actually not improved. So it's unclear whether clinical effect of bleach baths can be explained by just staph aureus reduction or astringent effects of the bleach bath. But if you're going to recommend this, and we do rec uh, recommend this in our clinics, is then we tell them that to soak the whole body, but then we ask them to get washcloths, uh, which they would put on the face uh, at the same time. What about wet traps? Well, what is wet trap? Wet trap is actually only an acute crisis intervention. It is not meant for, uh, it, not that it's not meant, but it will never work for cornix. You can't ask a patient to do it all the time. So usually I tell them, let's do a wet trap for about a week, uh, and then after that it's just the soaking and application of moisturizers. So what it is is after bathing again, uh, apply with emol apply on the skin your emollients or topical corticosteroids, and then a first layer of wet gauze, and then a second layer over that. <clears throat> the benefit is that it does is a, it is a barrier to scratching. It, it decreases the itch scratch, uh, scratch cycle. It increases steroid penetration because now it's under occlusion. It allows rapid healing of the escoriated skin, and it decreases the staph aureus colonization. Evidence-based clinical review of a wet trap therapy in children with severe or refractory atopic dermatitis, where well, wet traps using cream or ointment is an efficacious short-term treatment. Wet traps with topical corticosteroids is more efficacious short-term treatment than emollients only. However, there is some absorption of the corticosteroids. Wet traps with diluted topical corticosteroids for up to 14 days is actually safe in children. They have detected temporary systemic bioactivity of the steroids, um, but there is no actual clinical side effect that was noted from the topical corticosteroid absorption under occlusion. Lowering the amount of topical steroids, obviously, to once a day, and further product dilution can reduce the risk of systemic bioavailability. And that is why it is only considered for short-term treatment as well. What did they see? Well, across the board, uh, topical corticosteroids plus the wet trap compared to topical corticosteroids alone, those with steroids and wet wrap actually did better in terms of improvement or reduction of erythema, papules, like canification, exudation, excoriation, and dryness. What about antiseptics? We talked about antiseptic soaps. So patients with frequent bacterial infection may be a candidate for antiseptic. Uh, you can apply it on whole body or critical region. And what are the antiseptics that are available in the market? Triclosan is one of them. Uh, it's an anti has antibacterial activity against Staph aureus, Klebsiella, Proteus. Uh, resistance is clearly observed, and they are found in very common um, products out there in the market. Dial liquid soap has triclosan, soft soap, Lyrasil. Pisoderm antibacterial skin cleansers, and chlorhexidine, which is hibiclens and hexaclens. The concerns on this is that, one, staph aureus eradication and atopic skin is obviously only temporary, only as much as you're using your antibacterial soap. And there is a possible systemic absorption and possible long-term side effects with extensive use in severely compromised skin barrier in atopic dermatitis. 
So that for prolonged use. The conclusion of this study by Wallenberg is that um, the addition of antiseptics to emollients or baths on a regular basis is reserved for, one, special manifestations of atopic dermatitis, the weepy type of AD, special circumstances, mothers of small babies, and the elevated risk of systemic infection patients with indwelling catheters or chronic wounds may uh, benefit from a short-term uh, use of this an, uh, antibacterial or antiseptics. Topical nepurocin is used for localized impetigenized lesion. However, if it is an extensive rash, systemic antibiotics is the way to go. Uh, it, it can be used for treatment of nasal carriage, especially uh, staph. And anti-inflammatory topical uh, therapy with corticosteroids or uh, tacrolimus has been shown to improve atopic dermatitis and reduces staph colonizations by itself, even without topical mupirocin. So if you treat the atopic dermatitis, your colonization actually already improves by itself, and you may not need the topical mupirocin. It might be worth uh, um, using for carriers like uh, the 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 mothers of, of these kids with uh, colonization. Oral antibiotics. When you see overt pustules and vesicles and furuncles, uh, when you have serous crusting and oozing, uh, and you have atopic dermatitis recalcitrant to other topical therapies, consider starting oral antibiotics. And the antibiotics recommended are your cefadroxyl, cefalexin, cefidir, trimetoprim, sulfa, methoxazole, and in older kids or in adults, tetracycline. You know that this is contraindicated in children. Astringents, I use this if I have oozing, weeping lesion. I have them dissolve a packet of domiboro in water. I have them put it in gauze or a washcloth, and I have them apply it in this area 15 minutes three times a day. It has a drying effect. It helps eliminate the local infection, and aluminum acetate can be used as a moist compress. Again, a short term, just dry those wet lesions, and then apply your topical corticosteroids. What are the strategies in the use of topical corticosteroids? Uh, to increase compliance, it has been shown that fluticasone, um, propionate, uh, cutivate, uh, and mometasone, which is elecon, are effective on a once a day rather, uh, uh, treatment. And so maybe a once a day rather than a twice a day will increase our compliance. Again, fluticasone has been shown to be effective in children over three months of age, even on the face, and significant body surface area for up to one month. So again, less side effects, it looks like, and chronic use, you can get away with uh, fluticasone. And fluticasone patients as young as three months show that long-term maintenance of twice a week is actually safe and effective, as shown by Birth Jones. The limitations of topical corticosteroid therapy, I see my severe atopic dermatitis patient at least once a month or once every two months to monitor, the most important is monitoring topical corticosteroid therapy and what do I look for? Well, when I see skin looking like this, starting to be shiny and thin, so atrophy actually is a pretty high side effect, uh, 35%. It is reversible at this stage if you stop the topical corticosteroids. To prevent this, I alternate topical corticosteroids with topical pimecrolimus or tacrolimus. Colingitasia, again, very small prominent blood vessels is a side effect, especially in the face. Dispigmentation, hyper or hypopigmentation. Perioral dermatitis, fairly common. And A. At this stage, this is actually uh, irreversible. Once you reach this stage, um, uh, 
it, it's not going to improve even if you stop the topical corticosteroids. What about topical carcinoma inhibitors? It's especially useful in areas that are prone to atrophy, which is where your steroids will be contraindicated, such as eyelid, perioral, genital, axilla, and inguinal area. It has been uh, long-term use. Yes, there is still the black box warning, but prospective and long-term studies did not seem to um, um, uh, uh, support the fact of, of the malignancy in topical carcinoma inhibitors, regardless the FDA still left that warning on anti-inflammatory potency equivalent. So 0.1% tacrolimus is equivalent to an intermediate corticosteroid, like, such as your fluticasone or cutivate, which is, uh, so, so that your tacrolimus of the highest percentage point one is just an intermediate strength corticosteroid, it's not a high strength. And this is more potent than your one percent pimacrolimus. Proactive treatment has been shown to be safe and effective for up to one year in reducing flares. So when you've exhausted all your other topical therapies, when is it time for systemic therapies? Moderate to severe atopic dermatitis with failure of topical agents and recurrent complications such as infections may benefit from systemic therapies. We know everybody puts them on oral corticosteroids. It's generally effective. We know it's effective. However, it always is associated with dramatic rebound, so we rarely uh, use oral corticosteroids except for crisis management. And if you do need to do that, you need the strategy for long-term maintenance, tapering of the dose, and intensify your skin care. Uh, we tend to go with oral carcinoma inhibitors, such as cyclosporin, as an immunosuppressive therapy, although tacrolimus and pimacrolimus has been, uh, oral has been uh, looked at as well, mycophenolate, mofetil, and azathioprine. So, as I said, we tend to go with cyclosporine first. What's the dose for atopic dermatitis? It's about 3 to 5 milligram per kilogram per day. We give it for six weeks, and then we decrease 1 milligram per kilogram per day every two weeks until uh, 1 milligram, uh, and, and then increase the interval by one day every two weeks. So it's a long process, but we, uh, we try to get them in remission as long as possible. Children as young as 10, 22 months actually responded 2.5 milligram per kilogram per day. It's interesting that from our experience and other dermatologic experiences that the children tend to tolerate cyclosporine treatment better than adults. There is rapid response in two to three weeks with an excellent, good to excellent clearance. The thing is you will need to do a lot of monitoring. Uh, we monitor liver function tests, lipids, magnesium, potassium, renal function. Uh, it is a limited duration of treatment. You really can't expect to put people on it uh, more for two years without expecting renal compromise. So we really still try to get them uh, off it about six to eight months. Other therapy, uh, such as topical corticosteroids or, or uh, UV therapy has to be added to enable you to decrease your cyclosporin. There was a rapid rebound in 50%, but 10% is sustained remission of over six months. In a one-year study of cyclosporin in children showed no significant difference between intermittent and continuous treatment in efficacy or safety. So you can stop it for a while and then you can resume this again. One uh, caveat here is one pearl is that your cyclosporine generic is not equivalent to the branded. In other words, your near, the, 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 the release of the active drug in the generic cyclosporine is not predictable. And therefore, I make it a point and tell my patients you need to get the branded. And there are two brands that are out there with more consistent um, release of active medication and better control. This is a checklist that we use uh, uh, for a baseline and then what we follow up. Mycophenolate, mofetil, or CELCEPT, uh, it inhibits the inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Um, 
Four to six week response, 10 to 90% good or excellent clearance in the studies. No long-term data in children. Again, the same thing, you need to monitor CBC and LFT, smile, suppression, liver, and GI toxicity. Seem to have less side effects than cyclosporin, but also uh, 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 less strong. So it's sustained remission after eight weeks, 85% with sustained remission of more than five months. What I uh, do with patients who I try to take off um, cyclosporin and they start to rebound is to switch them to cell set for a short period of time and then if they need to go back on the cyclosporin, I'd do that. So, um, so that's the uh, ultraviolet light is another one that you would have to send them to the uh, dermatologist. So what about once you get them under control? Well, once you get them under control, you're ready for the proactive treatment of atopic dermatitis. Uh, and this is a study uh, in Europe where uh, they stabilized the, first, the patient first, and then uh, they, they uh, blinded them into either uh, the colimus as against corticosteroids, got them cleared up, and then they put them on a maintenance phase where they randomized them to double-blind vehicle control for up to 40 weeks. And uh, disease your last treatment with open label to chromos twice a day up to a maximum of eight weeks or until it's achieving a good rating or clearance or almost clear. So what is the result of the proactive treatment? Well, you will see that patients on tacrolimus, again, have flare-free days. There are significantly more flare-free days and a significantly uh, decreased number of disease relapse days on uh, proactive treatment. What about pro and proactive treatment, meaning you have to apply something in the skin about twice a week and that you can use topical corticosteroids, that's been shown with proactive treatment, as well as topical uh, carcinoma inhibitors can also use as a proactive treatment. So there are some studies. I tend to separate the Monday and Wednesday for them to apply the active drug. If you look at other studies, some studies just say weekend, Saturday, and Sunday, you apply your tacrolimus or your topical corticosteroids, and then you give it a rest on the next five days. So you can do either one. Prevention. So maternal avoidance. Neonatal avoidance, breastfeeding, and stopping the atopic march are all part of prevention. Uh, I just wanted to summarize this because this is um, uh, effects of early nutritional intervention and development of atopic disease in 2008. It replaces the 2000 policy statement from American Academy of Pediatrics. And this is just a summary. So there is no major role for maternal dietary restriction during pregnancy or lactation. So you don't tell the mom not to eat peanut or not to drink milk or, or whatever with pregnancy or lactation because there's no evidence. Breastfeeding for at least four months prevents or delays atopic dermatitis, cow milk, cow milk allergy and wheezing in early childhood. Modest evidence that the onset of atopic disease in infants at high risk of A to P and not exclusively breastfed for four to six weeks. In other words, mom can't breastfed for whatever reason. May be delayed or prevented by the use of hydrolyzed formula. And there is little evidence that delaying the introduction of complementary foods beyond four to six months will actually prevent atopic disease. <laughs> I always get questions on probiotics and atopic dermatitis, and I just wanted to present to you the different uh, uh, references in literature. So this is a meta-analysis, which tells you that there's a modest role in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Um, the duration agent probiotic use did not affect the outcome. There are, as you know, hundreds of different types of probiotics out there, and that's the problem with these studies, is um, different pro probiotics seem to have different results. Another meta-analysis by Lee showed that more convincing for probiotic in prevention rather than treatment. So if your patient already has severe atopic dermatitis, it may not be as uh, good as giving it to them before. <clears throat> this is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. 
<laughs> where lactobacillus GG during pregnancy and early infancy did not reduce the incidence nor alter the severity of atopic dermatitis. A Cochrane database system review concluded that probiotics are not effective in treatment for eczema in children, and that was in 2008. What about vitamin D? Well, vitamin D may play a role in regulation and antimicrobial peptides in uh, keratinocytes. 48% uh, of patients up to 18 years with asthma, atopic dermatitis, and or food allergy had insufficient levels of serum vitamin D. And so what is that, um, how does that, what implication do we have in atopic dermatitis? Well, unfortunately, uh, the studies are again uh, conflicting. Uh, low frequency of atopic disease in children of mothers with high vitamin D intake. Another study showed atopic manifestations were more prevalent in group with higher intake of vitamin D3. And uh, another study in a double-blind placebo-controlled study in children with atopic dermatitis had significant improvement in baseline score. We, we obviously need more trials. Immunotherapy. Ten years ago, we would have said there is no role of immunotherapy to aeroallergens in atopic dermatitis. Until these practice parameters, we've been saying that, but these practice parameters now says that there is some data indicating that immunotherapy can be effective for atopic dermatitis when this condition is associated with aeroallergen sensitivity. So uh, these are the different studies which showed significant improvement in symptoms in patients who received this kit. Those response effect to dusmite immunotherapy together with topical corticosteroids. There are serologic and immunologic changes consistent with tolerance once they are on immunotherapy. And significant difference from baseline visual analog scores, CORAD, and medication use in mild to moderate uh, disease, but very marginal benefit on severe disease. Amalizumab, again, conflicting studies. Some show clinical benefits, some show no benefit as a monotherapy. Most of these studies actually do say there is no benefit as monotherapy and benefit when added to usual therapy. There are no specific markers found to identify potential responders, and as you know, it's not indicated for atopic dermatitis. Other strategies. Unabrut's a little expensive, but definitely helps. It's a compression dressing, usually made of cotton, and there's a zinc oxide paste that is incorporated in the bandage already. So it eases skin irritation, keeps the area moist, and promotes healing within the wound site. Uh, so Una Boots can be used. The thing is, it's a one-time use, and it could be expensive uh, for the patient. Silver impregnated clothing is interesting because silver reduces staph colonization and improves clinical parameters and reduces topical corticosteroids use in atopic dermatitis. I googled it, and it, it's not really that expensive, uh, and probably uh, shows some good results in children. So uh, let me end with this next few slides in terms of what's the treatment strategy for atopic dermatitis. Well, you see them early, hydration, decrease the itching antihistamines, but note that this doesn't do anything with the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis. Very important is, uh, is evaluate for triggers, food allergens, irritants, and microorganisms. At this stage, you may want to add some topical corticosteroids and topical carcinoma inhibitors. And mid-potent, super-potent steroids, wet traps, and tar preparations. And finally, you will have to go with oral corticosteroids as a rescue, cyclosporin, ultraviolet light therapy, and hospitalization. Fairly recently, I think this is just in 2012, last year, is this uh, uh, from the uh, Allergic Skin Disease Committee of the Quad AI, the management of difficult to treat atopic dermatitis. The algorithm is to first confirm your diagnosis 
and we discussed the other primary diseases, immune deficiency, metabolic diseases, and malignancies such as mycosis fungoides. Then find out the basics of management, assess severity and psychological social effects, make sure that they are adhering to uh, your instructions, prescribe emollients and topical corticosteroids, and provide education and information about application of drugs. When you've found your triggers, you will manage the food trigger or the aeroallergen trigger and manage re your related diseases. Treat your infections, do your cultures, uh, give generous, uh, general advice and prescribe antiseptics and antimicrobials. Uh, and if it's still refractory, uh, consider second-line therapy, which is your immunosuppressive drugs, phototherapy, hospitalization, and consider a request for a second opinion. Uh, please feel free to adapt this. We give this to our patients. We just encircle whatever we want them to use. Uh, these are the instructions on frequent moisturization, wearing loose-fitting clothing, keep fingernails short, bathe, and there's, there are instructions on what to use, Dow or Cetaphil, wet wraps, how to do it, bleach baths, and you can have two or three times a week. This is mix one four to one half cup of liquid Clorox into a full tub. You can start in a very young children. You can start with one tablespoon moving on up to, up to one fourth cup of bleach in a full bathtub of water. So that's the end of my lecture and our uh, we, uh, what we allergies want to do is to convert them from looking like this to kids that are very happy with skin that are like this. Thank you. I'm now open to questions. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> uh, this is Paul Dowling. Hi, Paul. I have a, a question for you. Um, you mentioned briefly in the, one of your last slides about tar preparations. And I know dermatologists around here have used those for a number of years. I've never really used any tar preparations. And what's the, what's the, the purpose of the tar preparations, or what is it supposed to do? We used to do we, the, the, you know that tar has a healing effect. You know that it has some anti-inflammatory effect as well. We use it a lot for psoriasis and um, and and seborrheic dermatitis. You have your tar shampoos. The reason why it, the, we we're not using a lot of tar preparations before is because it smells terrible, and it looks terrible. It has this 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 reddish color, and sometimes it can even stain the skin. Lately, there are a few be better acceptable tar preparations out there. So as an anti-inflammatory, it can be used. But you're right, very few people use tar nowadays because of the smell and the uh, very poor cosmetic effect of the tar, plus the staining of the skin. How do, um, when you apply it, I mean, besides the shampoo stuff, but for the, for the skin, mm -hmm. How long do you apply it for, or how long do you leave it on for? You leave it out for about an hour or so. You leave it on, and then you have them wash it off. Yeah. But they, can't, they really can't stand having it on all the time. Um, I also had another question about the antibacterial soaps. How yeah. often do you, do you see people developing contact dermatitis to those? Well, what it has are surfactants. So the incidence of contact dermatitis to antibacterial soap is the same to other regular soaps because the antibacterial itself is really the most common antibacterial allergy is neomycin and 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 that and those derivatives mm -hmm. as a, 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 the antimicrobial itself. Okay, so the it's really not the contact dermatitis that. It, the incidence is about the same with other soaps. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, the problem is the the absorption and the risk of of the antimicrobials on a chronic basis. On a rescue, you know, using it maybe. It, first of all, a lot of people use it. A lot of people without atopic dermatitis use it, but using it on atopic 
uh, dermatitis patients with skin barrier defect may increase the absorption. And these chemicals are really toxic. The triclosan is, is toxic, and the chlorhexidine uh, could have significant absorption. So what, how would you monitor for toxicity for those? What would you look for? It's actually not a clinical toxicity, but they have actually seen absorption, significant absorption of these uh, antimicrobials and uh, of these chemicals in the blood. Okay. I have to keep unmuting Brock. Um, I think his is. Oh, was I creating the echo? I think so. <laughs> okay. Oh, I turned my speakers down a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, that was a great presentation, and I'm itching all over. <laughs> but, like a uh, picture, huh? <laughs> what I was wondering is, uh, we've isolated a number of uh, allergens from malassezia. And, malassezia, yes. And, and it seems to be certainly uh, uh, a complication. But when you get IgE to it, is mm -hmm. it a consequence? Or is it actually a cause? I mean, is it, is, does it have anything to do with the symptoms or not? I, I don't know the answer to that because, because malassezia is very common even mm -hmm. in a non-atopic group, right? But not everybody has the IgE antibody to the malassezia. But yeah. the, the studies that, that I quoted is patients with IgE to malassezia and treated for it had an improvement of atopic dermatitis. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a problem we have with a lot of these mold allergies. And there are a lot of you know, IgE that may not be, uh, uh, it might be made because of the process. That, uh, obviously, the allergens get in, et cetera. And, and it's, the problem is, is it really causing any problems with disease or not? So. Uh, I guess but there is the, the study on this on atopic children with IgE to malassezia. Is it oh, well? The implication is it does exacerbate the atopic dermatitis because if you treat the malassezia alone, it improves the atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. So there is a mechanism, an IgE mechanism. So it it, it accentuates. It probably accentuates. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the immune responses in the skin. Yeah. Just, okay. like staph, just like the stuff aureus. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I guess, um, Dr. Fanacier? Yes. Um, I guess my question is, I mean, as a fellow, I, I haven't had a lot of chances to be able to prescribe, like, a topical calcineurin inhibitor. And I guess there's always that kind of maybe a little bit of fear of, like, using that. But then I guess corticosteroids is also has a side effect as well. Um, so I was wondering, like kind of what, I, you, I noticed you put some recommendations in your slides, but could you kind of just briefly say like sort of what would be your way of like choosing a calcineurin when say like you're worried about the steroid effect? Because I know the absorption is still going to be increased with someone who has the atopic skin or the atopic derm. Yeah. Yeah. So there are specific places that I would recommend a calcineurin inhibitor, the face, mm -hmm. the flexural areas, or areas where the eyelids and those uh, flexural areas where atrophy is a very significant consequence of topical corticosteroids. So that's one. Second is almost all my patients have both because I tend to cycle them. In other words, when I'm when I've gotten them under control, gotten them under control already, I would put them on the proactive treatment of twice a week. I would proactive treatment uh, twice a week for maybe about two to three months with topical corticosteroids and then topical carcinoma inhibitor. I try to cycle that. Third. Those with very severe atopic dermatitis will unlikely respond to your topical carcinoma inhibitors. As you know, it's only equivalent to uh, mid-potency corticosteroids, and that's your highest. That's your uh, protopic 0.1%. So I would treat them first with a higher, uh, with a more potent topical corticosteroids, and then would switch them over to topical carcinoma inhibitor.
Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Buzz, do you um, have a preference over picrolimus or tacrolimus? Uh, yeah, so the, what are, what's the difference? Tacrolimus is an ointment, Pepecrolimus is a cream, okay? Um, Pacrolimus has two preparations, which is 0.1 and 0.03, okay? 0.1 is the most potent. The 0.03 of Pacrolimus is equivalent to the Elidel. So this is a lower potency. Uh, in terms of, so it, it my preference is not the kind of preparation because I think Elidel, even if it was a cream, is more acceptable for people than putting in an ointment. And it is, it, it, I think it's equally effective. My choice is basically do I want a high, if I need a higher potency, I can only get it from the Tucker Limas 0.1%. Okay, any other questions for anyone? Okay, well, thank you very much, Liz. That was great. And thank you. And uh, thank you for being so amenable to your your schedule got changed twice. And I <laughs> no problem at all. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>